Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Uh, this is the last webinar for the year. We are looking to uh, talk about our roadmaps for the uh, new year. And, uh, and if you have any feedback, give, uh, give us uh, during the call, uh, during the Zoom call. So you can ask us questions through the Zoom chat. And uh, then of the uh, you know presentation, we'll discuss those questions. So with that, let's start. So we're going to just go over our various product lines and uh, how what we are looking to do. I mean, obviously, this is a tentative uh, roadmap. So as you know, year progresses, things will change, obviously. But this is sort of the general sort of high-level items that we have uh, in. Uh, planned at least for the next year. So first I'm going to talk about a number of features uh, that is going to affect not just a single product but across all our product product lines. So, so those are the platform improvements. So one of the things that we are looking to improve is uh, the installer user experience. So today, uh, you know, we use Helm to do all our installation so it will continue to be home. Uh, but uh, one of the challenges that uh, we see is that, uh, you know, uh, like the installation process uh, at this point, pretty much a single command once you have a license key, but uh, um, the upgrade process can be complicated, uh, especially because home doesn't upgrade the CRDs. And based on how this is done, it could lead to some, uh, you know, failure scenarios. Uh, so we're looking to address that. Uh, make sure that even on upgrade, uh, you know, Helm will update the CRDs. Uh, I mean, we were hoping Helm will do it officially, but I guess at this point, we'll just go ahead and do in a way that is work with Helm 3. So that's a one thing. The other thing that we have noticed is that right now, we use a validation webhook and mutation webhook across our most of our products. And those webhooks are running inside the uh, Kubernetes operator container itself. And sometimes that can lead to failure scenarios because uh, users will you know, insert a bad YAML, which can crash the operator. And as a result, you know, the webhook server will be unavailable and then users won't be able to clean it up. We have already uh, deployed a fix to in the in the latest release in the 11.24 release for kubedb where uh, you know a, a bad input will not crash the uh, operator so it will automatically recover but we're still looking to separate out the webhook server and this will also help as our api uh, crds evolve into sort of the v1 version we will be using the kubernetes crd conversion webhooks to support those additional versions uh, and, and this will be part of that. So another uh, improvement that we are looking to do is uh, today, when you try to install our product, you have to kind of get a license and you kind of have to decide whether to get a uh, community license or an enterprise license and all of that are what the way we are looking to uh, you know, address or improve this is uh, it will always going to get uh, enterprise license by default uh, and you know, if, uh, for the for 30 day period, and then after the 30 day period, if you don't upgrade to an enterprise product, it will just downgrade to a community license uh, once the trial period is over. So that way you don't have to make all these you know, decisions today, it's just uh, complicated. Uh, so it simplifies that aspect of the um, deployment or installation process. So those are the two things. The another thing that we are looking to do is something we have been working on for a while, which is kind of develop our, our own sort of uh, web-based UI. So today you can you know do interact with any of the kubedb product apps code products through uh, command line using kubectl um, uh, uh, or via API, since all most of the products are uh, CRD based, but we are also looking to do a web-based console. So where you will be able to deploy databases, uh, can look at all the existing databases, and uh, you know it will have uh, integration uh, for monitoring using Grafana uh, and Prometheus. 
So effectively, you know, you will be able to sort of get an end-to-end -end, uh, user experience in terms of a web-based console. Uh, and this has been in the works for a while, but uh, we're looking to release it uh, next year. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, interesting uh, challenges here, uh, making it work given our number of uh, CRDs and how they change over time. Uh, but uh, we're looking to address, uh, you know, release it next year. Uh, so the initial focus will be KubeDB, and uh, but uh, it will also, uh, you know, uh, as the first one, one gets out, we'll add support for all the other product lines, uh, sort of the, through similar mechanism. So this will be uh, available in two modes. So we're looking to run our own hosted version. Uh, you may have seen something like a byte builders you know, on our website quite a few times. So that kind of what we're looking to call it as the hosted version, but for our enterprise customers who are running you know, our products inside your own sort of uh, Kubernetes clusters, you will be able to deploy it yourself, you know, similarly with the Helm charts and all that and, and run it yourself. Another thing that we are looking to do is uh, support for our uh, CRDs. So today we have a lot of CRDs and especially uh, since we started working on our QForm project, number of CRDs are really in the thousands now. And as a result, uh, uh, so it is a kind of a challenge to make sure that those CRDs are properly documented. As a user, you know what the defined fields mean you know, uh, we do not want our users to just go to a, you know, go source code and find it out, right? I mean, that's not, not ideal. So we're looking to uh, develop like a kind of a documentation site. And, and the reason we're kind of calling it out separately because it will be like a separately hosted, uh, you know, sort of a domain so that, you know, not just our products, but any, any you know, CRD based project can be added there, but, uh, you know, starting with obviously our products uh, and, 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 you know, as, as different parts of our products, like, you know, kubedb is a stash. When you are using kubedb, you can also look up stash. So it'll be similar to how, if you are familiar with like a Java docs or Go docs, kind of similar like that, you know, you kind of give it a path to the CRDs group, you know, kind of kind version and the CRD name, uh, and it will automatically kind of take you to the documentation for that. And, you know, kind of should have some examples on how to do some common things with those YAML formats. So similarly, what we have in the concepts doc today, we are looking to sort of replace that with this uh, approach. So that's kind of what the uh, general uh, platform features. And then now going into KubeDB, uh, the things that we have are looking to do. So one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, should go, be out uh, fairly soon uh, in the, is the schema manager project. So in the schema manager, what this is doing is today, when you deploy a Kubernetes YAML, let's say a Postgres server or a MySQL server, it will create a Postgres, you know, cluster or a you know, MySQL cluster. And then, uh, you know, we create a root user, but then we leave it as is. Uh, we don't do anything more there. Maybe you can potentially initialize it. But that's about it. But with this project, what it will become possible is that you can run a single MySQL server or a Postgres server or Mongo server, but create separate databases, right? Effectively doing a create database command and then uh, create database and then create a user who which, uh, which user will be uh, sort of restricted or scoped to that particular database. So in a way, let's say you are, have a you know team of developers. You know instead of making everybody create their own database instances, which you could do, but you know it, it can add up if you have a lot of developers. Uh, you know as you keep adding CPU, in terms of CPU and memory, so you'll be able to effectively use a database as a kind of a shared resource, right? So you have one database and KubeDB will automatically kind of create a database for you based on a CRD. Uh, it will create a database user that will be scoped to that database instance, uh, uh, that database uh, schema. And then also you will be able to create an initial uh, sort of data in there, right? So you can kind of uh, create a schema, like you create tables, all that, or 
you will be also able to kind of restore from existing database, uh, you know, that, that has that, you know, where you took the backup using stash. So effectively, let's say you have a production database, you just want to be able to feed it into a local copy into this shared instance, you'll be able to do it. So that's, uh, that's what we are calling a schema manager. So today, this is kind of the, uh, you know, uh, the initial sort of goal for this project. Uh, but uh, we are happy to uh, get your feedback and, you know, keep improving on this. So the other feature that we kind of quite frequently get requests for is read replicas. Uh, so, you know, if you are using databases for your BI applications, so you're running, uh, you know, uh, like a report generation type long running queries, expensive queries, you may not want to run them on your production database. Uh, so we are looking to uh, add support for uh, sort of read on replicas. So this will be separate from the main uh, database and they are sort of the standby replicas. Uh, so we're starting with MySQL as a first, uh, you know, sort of the one database that we support. But as long as the, uh, you know, the databases which themselves support this pattern, it will be supported. So you can create like a read replica and, and then use that uh, to uh, do your uh, backups. Sorry, not the backups for your uh, you know, sort of report generation or BI business intelligence type of applications. Uh, so this will be done uh, in case of MySQL, we are looking to use async application. So what that effectively means is that uh, there will be no impact on the primary instance in terms of write performance because you know the MySQL is not going to wait for the application for the Z replicas to complete before it sort of goes to the next, next transactions, right? So it will be completely async. Uh, you know, as usual, you know, uh, based on your feedback, things will improve, uh, but this is where we're starting today. Um, the upgrade process, I mean, I already talked about uh, that we are looking to sort of improve the installer upgrade process. I think uh, that is part of this, but in case of uh, KubeDB, there is an additional component where, you know, we, we uh, sort of deprecate uh, certain, uh, let's say, version of a database. For example, there's an Elasticsearch uh, advisory right now because of that log forge, log 4 j uh, CVE. And once things like this happen, uh, we'll push a new release and we'll deprecate the old versions. But then the databases that they're running uses old, old versions. You know, right now you kind of have to manually go through them and decide to upgrade. Uh, you know, sort of run an upgrade ops request or potentially have to restart them. So things like that, uh, we are looking to automate all of that. Frankly, the web console is kind of a necessary part of this process because there we need to we need a way to be able to kind of communicate to the sort of the ops team or the dev team who is in charge of these databases that uh, you know the system thinks that there is a kind of some sudden operation needs to happen. Uh, you can kind of you know run it immediately or kind of tell it the system to run at a certain time period, like you know kind of when there is like a off time for the database instances. So this sort of thing. Uh, uh, so sort of effectively, you know, not just the operator upgrade, but even after operator upgrade, certain things needs to happen usually for databases. So this process will, you know, uh, this uh, will kind of automate that. And this will also sort of, you know, tie in their feature around like a TLS management. So right now, you know, we do have a automated TLS upgrade process uh, using SART manager, but the trigger is still sort of a manual, right? Like you know, it'll, it'll tell you, uh, it'll, if you trigger the ops request, it will do the, all the necessary operations in correct, uh, in a current, correct order, but the operation is still sort of triggered manually. So it's kind of like, think of like, you know, what do we today have auto scaling support uh, for like a CPU memory or storage? Essentially it's kind of going to an auto DBA mode. It's not just uh, the, you know, the CPU memory scaling, but you know, TLS management, if needs an automatic upgrade operation or recommended operation, those those all aspects of that, uh, it will start recommending those to the, uh, the, the the database users, effectively the database admins who are in charge of these databases, and then they can go ahead and approve it, or you can set up like you know just happen automatically. It will happen automatically. Uh, so. 
So now the other thing that we're looking to do is web dashboards. So this is a little bit different from our web UI. So when you're talking about our web UI, we are kind of just talking about like, you know, doing the database deployment, provisioning, Grafana, all of that uh, from the UI, but, but then each database also have their own dashboards, right? Like for example, if you are using Elasticsearch, there is Kibana. So today we have some instructions sort of written uh, you know, uh, in the documentation, like how to do these things, but we are looking to, uh, uh, you know, bring those under the operator support. So uh, when you deploy Elasticsearch database, it will be able to just deploy a Kibana instance. And uh, it, it will automatically connect that Elasticsearch instance. So you can kind of log into the Kibana and, you know, do whatever thing you need to do through those uh, dashboards. So this sort of thing, uh, we are looking to starting with Elasticsearch and Kibana as that's the one, you know, most frequently requested. Uh, but we are looking to do it for other databases. Uh, I believe there's a quite a few uh, sort of uh, key ones like Postgres is an important one. And we're looking to do some, there are some generic tools that can kind of work with multiple databases. So we're looking to do those things. I think there are like interesting questions around how the authentication for those systems will work. Uh, but uh, but it is, it is you know, we will start with at least if you have a, like a root access to the secret, you should be able to use it in a kind of a web-based UI. So this will, uh, you know, and, um, and yeah, and it will have all the, all the necessary authentication, making sure everything works correctly. Uh, so this is a thing that we have been uh, kind of discussing uh, for some time and looking to, uh, you know, work on this year. So this is a cross cluster deployment, right? So today, uh, you know, what with KubeDB we support is a single zone or multi-zone cluster. So you have like a Kubernetes cluster, maybe different nodes are in different zones. And, you know, you can kind of deploy all through a single uh, operator. But uh, there are interesting cases where, uh, you know, people are running a different Kubernetes clusters in different regions. Maybe one is running in, you know, maybe in Virginia, in US East region, maybe another one is running in US West, uh, maybe LA or something or Las Vegas. And then maybe there is another data center running in Europe. And those are all separate Kubernetes clusters because Kubernetes recommends that your API servers stay separate. Now, how are you going to, how can you run a database that can kind of, you know, run across those three clusters? So let's say you are running a three node cluster, you know, each node or each pod of the database is actually running on different uh, clusters. So this is kind of, a, a, I would say, a more of a research uh, end of project. I think that today the primary challenge is that um, Kubernetes itself uh, doesn't have a good way to establish across data center uh, uh, cross Kubernetes cluster communication, especially if you are using managed Kubernetes clusters. Uh, like let's say you are using GKE. Now, if you have a GKE cluster in multiple different physical location regions, that can work. But if you want to uh, establish a network uh, across GKE and EKS and Azure, that's quite hard because you know the cloud providers doesn't really work with each other. So, so there are certain uh, primitives that has been developed in the Kubernetes as a community. It's called an MCS, a multi-cluster uh, networking. So we're looking to uh, make this possible. I think the initial focus will be the case where uh, all the clusters are under the same provider, right? Like all by Google or all by AKS. So that's uh, networking is possible. I think the networking part is one big challenge. The other big challenge is, okay, now you have three pods, but they are running on three different clusters. Like how does it work? How does failover work? Can I make failovers happen when I need it? So there are quite a few interesting challenges and like where does the shared information leave, right? Like, you know, when you create these databases, uh, where do you uh, create those YAMLs, right? Like, because you can, if you create in one cluster, it's not going to work across other one. So there are uh, interesting uh, challenges, but but this is something uh, we do see a request from our uh, existing user base. So we're looking to kind of start working on it. So that's one piece. Um, the another thing that we are looking to work on is also in a similar fashion, somewhat uh, uh, research oriented, is that today, uh, you know, KubeDB kind of works as an operator. So the general expectation or the idea is that users are going to bring their own cluster 
and then uh, we deploy uh, QDB uh, operator using Helm chart and all of these things. Uh, well, this is uh, obviously going to continue to be a supported mode, but we are also looking to do a uh, kind of a completely turnkey DBS solution where you know you can just give us access to a AWS account or GKE account and uh, QDB will automatically manage the clustering process. So it, we are not necessarily looking to like a, develop our own sort of uh, clustering system, but it's going to work with uh, use the cluster API and like, you know, let's say if you are on Google Cloud, it'll use, it'll take over a GKE cluster, or potentially create a GKE cluster and run all databases in there, right? So this is a kind of the scenario where uh, the, the cluster is only used for database management, right? You're not looking to uh, running it as a shared cluster where your some applications are running uh, in some namespaces, databases are running other namespaces. It will be only just databases. So it will be like a sort of a, you know, purely DBS centric cluster. Uh, so this is uh, something, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, as usual, uh, you know, looking to do for cloud and on-prem, especially this will be important on on-prem when you are like, you know, running on bare metal, like how you manage the whole infrastructure. So, so in a way, you know, if you are end user of uh, KubeDB, uh, you don't necessarily have to know that it is running on Kubernetes unless you want to, I mean, it is okay if you want to, but, uh, but it will be that. So this is uh, going to be using cluster API uh, as a sort of the underlying infrastructure uh, sort of uh, API. Uh, so this is this is something uh, you know we're looking to make progress this year. I think another thing that uh, you have seen us kind of work uh, is uh, you know start to provide our own sort of uh, Grafana dashboards. But I think that's kind of just a starting point. But uh, a, we are looking to kind of you know give like a full monitoring solution for all these databases. Obviously you can, you know, develop those today yourself using, you know, all the exported uh, metrics and all of that. But, you know, but uh, the point is, the reason you are coming to KubeDB, uh, I hope is that, you know, as a user, you don't have to think about all these things, right? So this is all done properly using sort of the standard uh, open technologies, but all, uh, you know, pre-developed and managed and maintained. So, so this will also kind of part of the web UI that we've been working on, right? Like making sure everything is set up and you can set monitoring and all that. So it'll, uh, it'll be based on Grafana Prometheus and, uh, and you know, integrating into our dashboard. So that's uh, the general focus of this project. Uh, new database support. Uh, so we haven't really added any, any new database database support in the last two years. We kind of just, uh, you know, initially we took a like a breadth first approach, added a bunch of databases, but then last two years, I mean, last two years, meaning like 2020 and 2021, we have been focused on, uh, you know, just improving uh, sort of the completing all the sort of the day two aspects of this uh, databases. So this, here we hope to add new databases, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, which databases. This is still sort of under consideration. Uh, we have a, quite a few, uh, you know, that we uh, commonly see, and it could be database. It could be like you know, we do have some support for like a proxy SQL or things like that, which you know, kind of has been in an alpha stage. So we're looking to uh, you know bring them to kind of a production quality support, you know, not just a deployment, but like all aspects of the day to life cycle management monitoring, you know, all of that in this under the umbrella and, uh, you know, have a UI support and all of that. Uh, so in the same vein, we're going to be also uh, exploring kind of a, you know, improvements in the YAML format. Uh, so it'll always start with the new databases once when they are added uh this uh you know this ui uh, sorry the yaml format change will be backward compatible i mean at this point we have enough production users that that's kind of a uh, you know absolute necessity but it will be done using you know sort of a crd conversion mechanism so once we have a you know uh, explored all these options especially if you look at the storage uh, layer in the last uh, few years kubernetes has really like, uh, you know, revise their whole storage layer going from a kind of a built-in storage drivers to the CSI base and has like all kinds of ephemeral supports and all that. And we want to 
take advantage of all of that. Uh, and then like all kinds of flexibility that we see our users keep asking for. So, so it will really focus on those uh, flexibility in terms of this new API version. We're still looking to call it Alpha 3, but uh, you know, just because it will be kind of a bit of a uh, redesign in certain aspects, but it will be, uh, but, but you know, sort of the goal is to get to a better release, hopefully after this, uh, as you know, as all, all of the primary APIs of the, uh, you know, underlying Kubernetes APIs are kind of becoming stable. Uh, regardless whether we call it alpha, it doesn't necessarily mean alpha in the sense that, uh, you know, the operator itself is production quality. It's just that the YAML uh, format, we're still, uh, you know, exploring options here or, or improvements. Uh, now that's kind of what we have, uh, you know, uh, for QBB, I mean, as usual, things will probably change as the year progresses and, you know, hopefully we get your feedback. Uh, but uh, but this is kind of what we have in mind for now. And then uh, let's talk about a stash. Uh, stash is our database backup, uh, you know, and Kubernetes volume backup solution. So this one uh, actually is going to be uh, quite a, a number of big improvements. So this is actually, we have been working, I mean, kind of late 2022, I mean, have been discussing internally, like do a, next version of stash uh, so so that, that we are calling it b1 beta 2 api in this slide but it, it might change kind of how we put it out uh, in the final version but this will be uh, the requirement analysis and sort of the api design for this new, new api has been completed uh, in the last month so so we kind of have a clear idea where we want to go you know the implementation work has just started um, in the last week or so, last few weeks. Uh, so what are the major things that we are looking to do in this, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I would say it's kind of a complete rewrite really. Uh, I think uh, one of the things is just to support more flexible topologies, right? Like today we have a sidecar based approach, but then I have a job based approach, but there's kind of, you know, uh, one or the other, but in some cases you need both. Like for example, you might want to take a, you know, like a MySQL dump based uh, backup for a MySQL database, but then you also may want to run a continuous archiving using bin logs. Today, things like that, you know, isn't really possible. You can do one or the other, right? So, so that's kind of a, one of the areas. I already talked about this storage layer revision that has happened in the Kubernetes. Um, you know, it, uh, like they have introduced things like ephemeral um, containers. Like, you know, today, uh, if you need to kind of access the disk, we have to go to the disk itself and inject a sidecar on those all the times. By doing these ephemeral containers, you know, you don't have to run those sidecars at all times. You know, if you are taking a backup only like four times a day, you can inject a sidecar into the pod you know, for those four times a day and, you know, kind of save on the CPU memory that's used for these operations, right? So there are like things like that, that can be optimized, improved, you know, uh, that will be part of this. Um, another key focus is on UI. Uh, so, you know, so far everything has been uh, terminal focused and uh, which is, uh, you know, served as well, but, uh, but as things progress, users do expect to be able to do more things from UI. And today, certain things are sort of hard to access from the UI because it's just, you know, like building a UI focused API. So designing those custom resources and things like that in a way, or, you know, having all the data available so that the UI can be built quick and fast. Uh, like, you know, like if, you, if a backup fails, be able to access the log for that backup, things like that, you know, making sure everything can be done, uh, you know, the best it can be, best in class in terms of database backup solution, uh, data backup solution in Kubernetes. So that's the focus. Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of already talked about the other ones, physical backup, point in time recovery support. So, so you know, so overall, I mean, there are even interesting cases that we are looking to support. Uh, one of the requirements that we have from our users is, okay, uh, I want to take backup into multiple uh, sort of uh, buckets, like a, you know, their disaster recovery, 
planning requires and they have multiple uh, offsite backups, not just in a single uh, location. So, so like today that's kind of really difficult because you have to set up two backup configuration, but then data kind of copied twice and all that. We want to make sure that those things are done in a properly optimized way when we recover, those are also available appropriately. Um, so this is kind of the uh, big items. Uh, we have a plan for a stash. I think uh, once this is available, uh, we'll, we'll be integrated into KubeDB. So that, that will be another sort of big item here. Uh, next part of Vault. Uh, so this is our, uh, you know, the Vault management project, right? Like if you want to uh, do uh, user secret management uh, for KubeDB, uh, manage databases or just general secret management. This is where, uh, you know, where we recommend. So this uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, deployed in production this year by multiple teams. Uh, so, so we are looking to, you know, kind of co complete out uh, all the features that you would expect from a production quality uh, operator support. So effectively automating all the day two operations, seeing that you were, you know, seeing more with the uh, KubeDB kind of bringing similar type of uh, support for Vault, right? So you can update versions, scale it up, you know, you can reconfigure PLS, back up the data, all of that will be part of it. Um, and then uh, TLS management is a big one. Uh, I mean, today we can, you know, provision certificates, but making sure the certificates get auto renewed and done automatically before like, a, uh, you know, the world server TLS certificates run out, all of that will be part of this, uh, you know, approach. Uh, so the Cube Vault has a CLI, but we are looking to uh, may you know bring various improvements. So this set of improvements, kind of you know, quite a bit, few of these actually already been worked on and should be out uh, fairly soon. Uh, and then like we already have support for secrets CSI driver, but it does require like creating a bunch of different CRDs and all of that, making sure that those can be done easily for something like a KubeDB managed databases. You know those those sort of the uh, focus right like i mean the generally the thing that we are trying to achieve is that uh, make you know make the tools and uis and clis everything uh, you know as intuitive as possible so that you don't have to read like a lot of documentation you know it's just a uh, i mean i mean i guess uh, you know in kubernetes world everybody do expect to read a lot of documentation but but we're trying to make sure that you don't Right, like, yes, I mean, obviously documentation has to be there, but, you know, I mean, ideally you should be able to use the product without having to read a lot of documentation. So uh, so that's kind of uh, where this is coming along. And, and frankly, the UI is also part of that, right? Like, you know, uh, because some way you need to be informed that what, what is available uh, and what is possible so that, uh, you know, you don't have to go and read up like a YAML format uh, documentation to do it. But but um, so so that's kind of the focus. I think you know it, it's in a way it it has required you know taken us so much time because we had to kind of stabilize our YAML formats before we can kind of you know building this sort of that sort of that layer two you know things on top of these products. So so but uh, you know we're looking to work on this this year. Um, so, you know, in similar vein, we are looking to probably do a Alpha 3 API. Uh, we already have a few different things that, you know, we generally see requests from the users. So it kind of in a way, you know, we want to make it kind of almost, uh, you know, uh, bring the sort of similar type of functionality that we are doing for our KubeDB APIs. Uh, so it will be uh, backward compatible, right? With the CRD converter and all of that, but, but this is something, uh, you know, we have uh, kind of considering uh, and hopefully want to work on. So, so we have a project called QForm uh, and, you know, uh, the, using QForm, it's kind of really what it is. Like if you are using Terraform today, so any Terraform resource that you can generate, we have a corresponding uh, Kubernetes CRD. And when you apply that CRD, uh, the Terraform, uh, you know, uh, underlying the Terraform provider SDK, we are not doing Terraform apply or command line interface, but underlying Terraform SDK is used to provision these resources. Now, this has been, 
you know, uh, available for some time. Uh, uh, now, what we are looking to uh, the current work that has been ongoing is that Terraform module support. Uh, I think we talked about this uh, particularly in the last Qform uh, webinar. I think around like a month ago. Uh, so, so supporting both uh, sort of uh, use cases, right, where you have a lot of existing Terraform modules and just want to bring that into Kubernetes with Qform, that will be possible. The other one is, okay, you want to start with this uh, CRDs as a first class uh, citizen and be able to deploy like a bunch of, uh, you know, Kubernetes, it's not, not Kubernetes, non-Kubernetes resources, right? Like cloud resources. Let's say you want to create like a three VMs and then maybe deploy some kind of, I don't know, VPC rule and then set up this and that, all of that, especially if you are on AWS, it can get quite complicated like doing those, making those possible and have, you know, and making sure that those can kind of support this internal dependency, right? Like a, apply a fast CRD with custom resource, wait for that to kind of, you know, become ready and then get some data from that and do the next thing and things like that. Uh, so this sort of thing uh, will be, uh, you know, this is one of the kind of the main thing that I, uh, we have been working on and and the question is like, why are we doing all of this, right? It is really, you know, part of the uh, whole uh, KubeDB user experience, right? Today, let's say when you are using KubeDB, uh, yes, the database piece that is kind of native to Kubernetes is automated, but you still have to kind of do a bunch of things manually, right? Like if you want to take a backup, you have to create a bucket, get a secret, you know, set up these things, all of that. And it's just a lot of things that needs to be done correctly, right? And and our, you know, ultimate goal is to be able to just do all of that uh, automatically. So creating buckets, if you are like on AWS, making sure the proper VPCs are enabled or in open and all that, whatever it is necessary, uh, firewall rules configured, you know, not just uh, on AWS, but other clouds, you know, if you are on-prem, all of that, uh, and and that's kind of the way we are coming from uh, into this, uh, you know, the Qform project, right? Like, yeah, I think the thing that I was just talking about, like, you know, we want to make sure that you don't have to read a lot of documentation and the way to, one of the way to make users not have to read a lot of documentation is to just do it automatically, what is appropriate uh, and, and, you know, and expose those through an UI, right? So, so that's, that's why the Qform project is quite important to us and it will be part of that user experience. Obviously, if you are looking to just use uh, it to manage or monitor your database, uh, sorry, Kubernetes resources, uh, sorry, cloud resources through Kubernetes, right? Kind of like, a, you know, in, in, a, in a scope, it is similar to the cross-plane project. I think that primary difference between cross-plane and our project uh, is that it is starting, uh, you know, with the Terraform providers as sort of the first class citizen, right? So if you have a lot of Terraform investment, which we do see from across our customer base, it will become possible to do it. Um, so those are sort of the main things. And then we do have this uh, Voyager project, which is a ingress controller for Kubernetes. Actually, this is our first project that, you know, we kind of open sourced many years ago, back in 2016, uh, late 2016. I think uh, right now the project is pretty stable as the ingress API has been stable and used in production various places. So uh, one of the things that is happening, exciting thing in the Kubernetes ingress world is the, the new service gateway API. Uh, so this API has been you know, iterated by the Kubernetes upstream project uh, you know, actively. So right now they have a alpha API. So they had alpha V1, alpha one, then they kind of deprecated that had a V1 alpha two API. And, and frankly, we're looking to you know, wait, waiting for them to kind of get to a beta status before we explore uh, supporting it. Because you know, as you know, that uh, you know, alpha APIs, you should, really shouldn't be using alpha APIs that are coming from the upstream Kubernetes. Uh, because because, because the support, there is really like no proper support. And sometimes alpha API doesn't even go to production ever. Right, uh, so that's why uh, we're, you know, so that's why we're kind of uh, waiting for them to sort of iterate and get to a stable place. So this is kind of like ingress V2 and looking to add that. And, and also the part of the cross cluster, uh, you know, things that we are discussing or kind of talking about 
uh, it will be also important in that respect, right? Let's say if you are running all your databases in one cluster and then want to access from a different cluster, maybe even in the same region, like how you do those, how those TCP connections are exposed and all of that, especially if you are on-prem, which uh, quite a few of our uh, important or big customers are. Uh, like, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, like we have a clear cut answer for all of them. They don't have to think about those things. Um, so those kind of uh, what we are looking to do uh, from a product perspective. Uh, I mean, uh, beyond that, you know, in terms of our sales and marketing, you know, you probably have noticed that we have been kind of doing a pretty regular webinar every two weeks. So we're looking to do more of that. Uh, you may have noticed very recently we have started doing like a short video clips, kind of like a tutorial style clips for various features for our various products, right? I mean, it's also part of that process that now that you know, the YAML formats are more stable. It's actually worth investing in that because otherwise if YAML formats are continuously changing, you know, the video clips kind of get very uh, outdated very quickly and it's very hard to revise them, right? In a documentation, written text, you can update that. But video clips kind of takes quite a bit of time to, you know, record them, sort of edit them and all of that. So we're looking to work on that now. And more blog posts. So this is just general, in general, you know, work on any kind of content focused, uh, you know, communication from us. And and we would love to have, you know, you write kind of guest blog post if you're interested in, you know, how you are using various KubeDB products, um, uh, Kubernetes uh, apps code products, uh, you know, KubeDB stash or whatnot. Uh, like if you want to write about it, we'll be happy to host that content, right? So we uh, you know, so that's uh, that will very very much welcome. Uh, in general, we're looking to do some website redesign. I mean, uh, you know, it's not a major redesign, but uh, but just, uh, you know, it hasn't been updated in almost a couple of years. So we're looking to do some of that, uh, you know, as now that we have a lot more uh, content and, you know, just uh, customers and all of that. So it will be part of that focus on SEO. Uh, so that's kind of uh, what we have uh, in terms of the presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So I see that there have been couple, uh, quite a few questions. So I'll uh, just kind of go over those and try to answer them. So will Web UI be a central console to deploy database on multiple cluster or will it be deployed on each cluster? So it will be a centralized console. Uh, so you know, you, you'll be able to sort of just connect different Kubernetes clusters to this centralized console uh, and, and just uh, deploy databases across all of them. But uh, obviously you can also just deploy the same kind of console, this uh, web UI uh, in each cluster and just manage that one locally. Um, so, so both modes will be supported. Uh, when the UI available understand will be hosted by you, will be on-prem. Yeah, so it'll, it'll have both modes, right? So we are looking to host a version of it, right? I mean, it's all part of the same aspect and uh, sort of explore, uh, intention to make kind of reduce any friction, you know, users uh, experience with a uh, kind of a Kubernetes, uh, like a platform product, right? Like if, you know, we just want to simplify everything you have, make it very easy to get to a kind of a working something within the like next, you know, like the moment you come to the website and get to a working product, like we want to make it happen within the first 10 minutes. Right, and that's that's why we're looking to also have a hosted version in, you know, uh, but but yes, but for the users who are looking to just, you know, enterprise uh, customers and looking to host it themselves, they will, you'll be able to do it uh, directly yourself. Uh, so yeah, so those kind of the, what do we have? Uh, if you have any other question, feel free to sort of unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, I'm happy to answer. Uh, if you have any feedback, uh, you know, you can also share it with us via email. You obviously, you have our email address, you know, hello at appscode.com or just support at appscode.com. Uh, I mean, uh, you can just email us there. Uh, you know, you can uh, I encourage you to follow our uh, Twitter account. So we kind of, you know, the product specific account, so you can keep up to date on that. Uh, 
and then those who have access to our you know sort of the chat channels uh, you know feel free to talk to us via those mechanisms also uh, we're always happy to you know hear your feedback and uh, you know keep improving the product for you so with that uh, we're going to end the presentation today uh, so thank you everyone who joined uh, happy holidays, you know, it's almost uh, end of the year 2021 and a Merry Christmas if you, you know, observe Christmas and uh, we hope to see you again in the new year uh, with the new webinars and uh, new updates. Uh, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you everyone.